Hello, my name is Jessica, and I would like to share with you new concerns about the risks posed by the carbon pipelines here in Iowa. Although the hearing before the Iowa Utilities Board for Summit Carbon Solutions has now stretched across four different months, precisely during Iowa's harvest season, other news across the Midwest has shown these pipeline projects coming to a definitive end. The North Dakota Public Service Commission denied Summit's pipeline application. South Dakota's Public Utilities Commission denied both Summit and Navigator's applications. Recently, Navigator Heartland Greenway canceled their entire project after unsuccessful attempts to obtain easements and a sequestration site. And just last week, staff at the Illinois Commerce Commission, the Illinois equivalent to the Iowa Utilities Board, recommended that the ICC deny a pipeline permit to Wolf Carbon Solutions. Indeed, what we've seen in the last few weeks across the greater Midwest is the result of local and state governments coming to terms with the real risks that these carbon pipelines pose to local residents, centered on the issue of setbacks. The distance between a CO2 pipeline and a house, a business, church, school, nursing home, or as we saw in the case of Bismarck, North Dakota, the future development of an entire city. Coincidentally, last week I obtained a copy of the plume dispersion model developed under Navigator's guidance, the computer model of how far a deadly cloud of carbon dioxide would travel should a pipeline rupture occur. And I will be analyzing this report with you in my discussion of safety concerns today. Let me begin, however, first by clarifying a couple of things about the dangers of carbon dioxide. I'm going to be drawing principally from the following resources. Thenorska Veritas, or DNV, Design and Operation of CO2 Pipelines, the United Kingdom's Health and Safety Executive, Assessment of the Major Hazard Potential of Carbon Dioxide, Compressed Gas Association, OSHA, ACGIH. These are governmental or independent industry safety administrations that Navigator cites in their plume dispersion model. But before I go into the details, I want to caution, if you are an adult watching this video and your children can hear this, please watch at a later time. There are some things, if heard and comprehended, that cannot be forgotten. Okay, so most of us are well aware of the fact that CO2 is an asphyxiant. As an asphyxiant, carbon dioxide displaces the normal oxygen that is in the air and can result in unconsciousness or death by suffocation. It's one and a half times heavier than air, so it does not immediately dissipate into the atmosphere when released, but tends to gather along the ground, especially in low-lying places like valleys or river bottoms. And those of us mammals who live on land, and that would be all humans, are at risk. And so are flora and fauna of many kinds, from microbes living within the soil, to the plants on the soil surface, to livestock grazing above. But it isn't asphyxiation that, in my judgment, is actually the most terrifying risk posed by carbon dioxide. There's more to it than the displacement of oxygen. The Compressed Gas Association puts it very bluntly. Carbon dioxide itself, quote, does not support life and can be dangerous even when adequate oxygen is available, end quote. That's because carbon dioxide is not only an asphyxiant, at the cellular level, it is a toxicant as well. Research confirms that, quote, it leads to an increased respiratory rate, tachycardia, cardiac arrhythmias, and impaired consciousness. Concentrations greater than 10% may cause convulsions, coma, and death, end quote. At concentrations of 10% carbon dioxide, there is still enough oxygen in the air. We do not suffocate, but we die. Many of us have known, ever since the informational meetings in Iowa began in 2021, that carbon dioxide plus water equals carbonic acid. But I must admit that not until recently did I come to fully appreciate something about carbon dioxide and the human body. I mean that so much of the human body is water. There is a complex and delicate relationship between water, carbon dioxide, and carbonic acid that is ongoing internally, automatic, and vital for human life, since carbon dioxide is a byproduct of energy production at the cellular level. The UK's Health and Safety Executive writes in their report that although CO2 is commonly thought to pose a threat to life as an asphyxiant, 
and it does at high levels of concentration. At even relatively low levels of concentration, it creates, quote, an immediate threat to life due to the toxicological impact it has on the body, end quote. They continue, the inhalation of elevated concentrations of CO2 can increase the acidity of the blood, triggering adverse effects on the respiratory, cardiovascular, and central nervous systems. Depending on the CO2 concentration inhaled and exposure duration, toxicological symptoms in humans range from headaches, increased respiratory and heart rate, dizziness, muscle twitching, confusion, unconsciousness, coma, and death. Coma and death within one minute. DNV, the private risk and liability research company based in Oslo, Norway, developed a graph to show how this works. So along the x-axis or horizontal number line of this graph is the amount of time to which you are exposed to carbon dioxide measured in minutes. Each solid line indicates five minutes and each faint dotted line indicates one minute. Along the y-axis or vertical number line is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air measured as a percentage. The red line that you see on the graph indicates significant likelihood of death, S-L-O-D, the meaning of which is pretty self-explanatory. For example, you can see at a concentration of 20% carbon dioxide, death would likely be instantaneous. At a concentration of 15% carbon dioxide, death would come within one minute, as multiple other resources like the UK's health and safety executive have confirmed. At a concentration of just over 10% carbon dioxide, 10.5% to be precise, you would likely die within 10 minutes. If you're asking yourself who would stick around in a plume of carbon dioxide for 10 minutes, keep in mind that according to the research, in the 10 minutes leading up to your death, you would likely be experiencing hearing and visual disturbances, difficulty breathing, dizziness, severe muscle twitching, and finally unconsciousness. Remember, CO2 affects your brain, your lungs, and your heart. In other words, you would not likely be able to get yourself out. By the way, unless you have an electric vehicle, car engines will stall out and fail if they're in an area of high CO2 concentration because combustible engines too need oxygen to work. What about the blue line, the one labeled SLOT? It stands for Specified Level of Toxicity. The UK's health and safety executive explains what this means. The DTL, or dangerous toxic load, describes the exposure conditions in terms of airborne concentration and duration of exposure, which would produce a particular level of toxicity in the general population. One level of toxicity used by HSE in relation to the provision of land use planning. So by land use planning, they mean the planning of setbacks from the pipeline route, the prohibition of residential housing or buildings in which people will gather. I'm going to address this issue later because it's really important. So one level of toxicity used by HSC in relation to the provision of land use planning advice is termed the specified level of toxicity, SLOT. HSE has defined the LUP, that's the land use planning, again, SLOT, as you can see it here on your screen. Severe distress to almost everyone in the area, substantial fraction of exposed population requiring medical attention, some people seriously injured, requiring prolonged treatment, highly susceptible people possibly being killed. Who are the highly susceptible people, by the way? Those with underlying health difficulties, disabilities, or those who are advanced in age. And this may describe yourself or your neighbor. According to DNV's graph then, at concentrations around 7% carbon dioxide, you may experience severe distress, serious injury, or possible death within 15 to 20 minutes of exposure. One wonders how scientists determined all this. Tests, experiments on animals and humans, I hate to say, for example, there was an experiment conducted in 1929 in patients who, on patients who were, quote, mute and mentally inaccessible, suffering from schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and major depressive disorder. 
And there was a follow-up experiment from 1959 conducted once again on psychiatric patients. And that confirmed the effects of acidosis or the increased level of acid in your blood on the cardiovascular and respiratory systems. Of course, more recently, the experiments on unwilling human beings have been stopped, thankfully, but now CO2 is commonly used to euthanize laboratory rats, a practice that the Animal Welfare Society condemns, noting that, quote, at higher concentrations, CO2 turns to carbonic acid upon contact with mucous membranes, eliciting significant pain, end quote. The mucous membranes refer to areas in a mammal's mouth, nose, windpipe, lungs, stomach, and intestines. We are mammals. I am reminded here of a kind of accidental test case, a CO2 pipeline rupture in Satarsha, Mississippi in 2020, and of the victims whom emergency responders found unconscious in a fetal position, quote, white foam coming out of their noses and mouths, their clothes stained with urine and excrement. Is that what we want for Iowa families gathered around the dinner table one evening or one night sleeping in their own beds? I do not ask these questions lightly. After two years of meeting with neighbors who like myself oppose the build out of carbon pipelines in Iowa, I know hundreds of Iowans who live in the proposed pipeline corridor. And that includes three generations of my own family. Look, I know that there are carbon pipelines elsewhere in the United States, though they constitute a tiny fraction of the total pipelines in this country. Why is our situation so new and concerning? Because the carbon pipelines that do exist are in places like North Dakota, Wyoming, New Mexico, and West Texas, places whose pattern of rural settlement was quite different from that in Iowa. Of course, there have been accidents in those places. FEMSA, the Federal Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration tracks these accidents. Over a 10 year period, 2011 to 2021, there were 61 accidents involving the accidental release of carbon dioxide from pipelines. That's approximately one accident per 82 miles of carbon pipeline in the United States. But fortunately, those accidents, with the exception of Satarsha, have occurred in areas with extremely low population. For example, on February 10th, 2011, over 2,000 barrels of carbon dioxide were accidentally leaked near a carbon capture facility built off a lonely stretch of road in eastern New Mexico. And by the way, the FEMSA reports give exact longitude and latitude for the accidents, and so this is how I tracked them on Google Maps. The postal code there, 88410, corresponds to a population density of 0 0.26 people per square mile. By contrast, the postal code of 52314, where a navigator initially proposed running their carbon pipeline through in my county, has a population density of 99 people per square mile, over 380 times the population of the site in New Mexico. Or take the leak of over 2,000 barrels of carbon dioxide on May 2nd, 2014, near the Oxypermian facility in Texas, in country dominated by oil derricks. Those are all the light spots that you see on the map here. These aren't houses. These aren't places of residence. These are oil derricks. If you zoom in, you can see them. These are miles from the nearest habitable structure. Iowa does not look like this. Iowa has been blessed with some of the most fertile soil in the world, and that has meant that settlement of farmers happened in relatively small parcels of land, one quarter section at a time. And as a result of agricultural abundance, we are gifted with hundreds of small towns that dot our landscape. We may be rural, but this land is far from empty. And that is why the issue of setbacks, the distance between the carbon pipeline and your home or your child's school or your small town is so important in Iowa in particular. Regarding setbacks, Navigator at their initial public informational meeting in Lynn County on December 6, 2021, listened to some of us in the audience asking about what a pipeline rupture would look like in terms of carbon dioxide release. 
Navigator's engineer, Stephen Lee, said he didn't know how much CO2 would escape in the event of a rupture, but he reassured us that a 25-foot setback from inhabited structures, our homes, a default setback determined by the area of the right-of-way, by the way, was sufficient to mitigate risk. Mr. Lee said that Navigator might even put the pipeline further than 25 feet from your home, but he would not commit to a specific minimum distance beyond that of 25 feet. Assuming that Mr. Lee was professionally competent, we now know that in fact, he must have been familiar with the plume dispersion modeling that Navigator had commissioned and that you see here. He must have known because Navigator claims in this document that their routing philosophy was guided by a, quote, buffer distance for each nominal pipe size, which applies to residential structures and vulnerable places of gathering, end quote. Those are their words. That distance, they clarify, was based on hazard level four. For a six inch pipeline, six inch diameter pipe, the smallest lateral in Navigator system, that distance was 321 feet. For a 20 inch diameter pipe, the trunk line of the network, it was 1,029 feet, not 25 feet. What you may ask is hazard level four. Let's get into the details of Navigator's report because presumably what Navigator found applies equally to carbon pipelines proposed by both Summit and Wolf because they are proposing to transport the very same material although their own plume dispersion modeling is a closely held secret. Yes, there are portions of Navigator's report that are redacted, but as you'll see, we will be able to understand some of those portions nevertheless, because Navigator based much of their report on work that has already been published elsewhere. Here, you see the hazard levels one through four that Navigator developed. This is Navigator's report still. They're based on the toxic effects of the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air. Level one at a concentration of 30,000 parts per million, which in DNV's terms is 3%, is the area where after 10 minutes, quote, normal breathing could not be sustained. That's what Navigator's report says. It is also a limit for first responders, by the way. The Compressed Gas Association warns, personnel, including rescue workers, should not enter areas in which the carbon dioxide content exceeds 3% by measurement, unless wearing a SCBA, a scuba, or a supplied air respirators, so that's a self-contained breathing apparatus. In other words, in order for someone to be able to come in and help you evacuate, they have to have access to a self-contained breathing apparatus, or scuba, which runs upwards of $6,000 a piece. Our rural volunteer responders are not adequately equipped. As Jody Freet, Emergency Management Director of Cedar County, where Wolf proposes running its carbon pipeline, explained in an interview here with the Iowa Capital Dispatch, quote, I can't send my firefighters or my emergency medical people to respond. I have to call in a specialized hazardous materials team, quote, which she said comes from a 45 minute drive away. So that's a level one hazard, the level where no one can go in and help you except those with special breathing apparatuses. Level two is set at 40,000 parts per million or 4%. And it is described in Navigator's report as, quote, the atmospheric concentration of any toxic, corrosive, or asphyxiant substance that poses an immediate threat to life could cause irreversible or delayed adverse health effects, or could interfere with an individual's ability to escape from a dangerous atmosphere, end quote. Navigator says that it will coordinate with emergency responders whose jurisdictions fall within the boundaries of this hazard level. And they recognize that, quote, persons might need to evacuate via self-evacuation or assisted by first responders, end quote who, as I pointed out earlier, will need to be wearing self-contained breathing apparatuses, which severely limits the number of responders who will be available. Hazard level three is redacted, but note the rather unusual number in the concentration column, 63,000. Also note a similar situation for hazard level four with a concentration level of 105,000 parts per million. And so the redactions are really actually not a problem for us. The UK Health and Safety Executive, one of Navigator's stated references, provides the information in their table one concentration versus time consequences for CO2 inhalation. 
Notice that the table specifies SLOT, specified level of toxicity, and SLOD, significant likelihood of death. 63,000 parts per million, or 6.3%, is the level of concentration at which, after being exposed for 60 minutes, the SLOT, or specified level of toxicity threshold, is crossed. At 105,000 parts per million, or hazard level 4, as navigators calling it, the SLOT threshold is crossed after one minute. And as you see in the other column, after 10 minutes, there's a significant likelihood of death, or SLOD. And so it appears to me that this is the information that has been redacted from Navigator's report. The SLOT threshold reached at 63,000 parts per million after 60 minutes, and significant likelihood of death after 10 minutes at 105,000 parts per million. Navigator notes that they will, quote, implement additional design and operational measures for hazard level three and above, end quote, but they don't specify what these might be. And they do say that, quote, residential structures should be kept outside the hazard level four buffer, end quote. These so-called buffer zones or setbacks are what the dispersion modeling is all about. The model attempts to determine the distance between the pipeline rupture and these hazard levels. So here it is. Navigator chose to run reports based on the FAST and ALOHA protocols, basing their calculations on pipe diameter. FAST is governed by DNV and ALOHA by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Some caveats should be made before discussing the results. First of all, ALOHA has not been validated against real world experiments. And neither ALOHA nor FAST can account for topographic, topography or complex meteorology. These are not computational fluid dynamics models. And those would be state of the art, these are not. Moreover, uh, Navigator ran all of their models with a specified temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit Perhaps not coincidentally, studies have found that lower air temperatures make the CO2 travel farther. So we must understand that the high temperature input may have resulted in an underestimation of the real distances involved. This year, for example, Des Moines had 25 days with temperatures at 90 degrees or higher, but one wonders about the other 340 days of the year. Anyway, these are Navigator's results. Notice that the entire hazard three column, the level where, quote, additional design and operational measures, end quote, are necessary to protect residents is redacted. They're not gonna let us know. <laughs> Unfortunately, I cannot fill in these redacted numbers. They are not available in any other studies and have been produced by Navigator's study alone. Nevertheless, we can reasonably assume that the distances fall between hazard level two and hazard level four. And in fact, this table provides us with a lot of useful information. Looking at hazard level two, we can estimate the distance between the pipe and the area where, as Navigator explained, the concentration, quote, poses an immediate threat to life, could cause irreversible or delayed adverse health effects, or could interfere with an individual's ability to escape from a dangerous atmosphere, end quote. That is quite a hazard. For a tiny pipe of six inches, that distance is 1,240 feet, a little under a quarter mile. For a trunk pipeline of 20 inches, that distance would include the entire area within 2,920 feet, more than half a mile. And as for significant likelihood of death within 10 minutes, hazard level four, that's 1,029 feet from a 20 inch pipeline. Recall that in rural areas, first responders with breathing apparatuses might not get to your house until 45 minutes after a pipeline rupture, and that's if they get to your house first. Let's look at a couple examples of maps of the proposed carbon pipelines. Here is Wolf Carbon's map for Lynn County, where I am from. Helpful, isn't it? <laughs> but here is a map displayed using ArcGIS, a spatial analysis tool produced by ESRI Incorporated, and it's the bright pink that represents the pipeline. I've really zoomed in here to be able to show you something in particular. Wolf has routed their pipeline within tens of feet of property belonging to the College Community School District which is one of those school districts that houses all of the district buildings pre-K through 12th grade on one campus. 
On any given school day, over 5,000 school children are present on campus, plus staff, teachers, and administrators. Judging from this map, Prairie High, 10th through 12th grades, and Prairie Ridge, pre-K through 4th, are about 1,500 feet from the pipeline. Prairie Creek, 5th and 6th grades, is about 1,000 feet away. Now, Wolf has characterized this portion of their route as a trunk line, and in public comments, their representatives have stated that the pipe might be 20 inches in diameter. According to the researched plume dispersion modeling, then, Prairie Creek is within hazard level four, significant likelihood of death. And Prairie Ridge and Prairie High almost undoubtedly fall within hazard level three, the specified level of toxicity that, as we saw earlier, would result in, quote, severe distress to almost everyone in the area, some people seriously injured, and highly susceptible people possibly being killed, end quote. Moreover, nearly the entire school campus of over 5,000 students plus employees would be within hazard level two, which would require evacuation and possible assistance by emergency responders. If a CO2 pipeline ruptures here, how will first responders with limited equipment and personnel be able to get the children out in time? Moreover, one has to ask what kind of a company would propose a project like this? And what about Summit? Well, as you can see on October 3rd, 2023, Summit filed its dispersion analysis on the IUB docket, except that they made the entire file confidential. Indeed, Summit has long argued that the IUB cannot deny or revise any part of their proposed project or route on the basis of safety, nor can the IUB request any documentation regarding safety. As you see here, there are claims filed on the docket November 10th, 2022. Also on November 10th, Wolf Carbon filed a brief claiming specifically that IUB does not have, quote, jurisdiction to request copies of a pipeline developer's emergency response plan, a risk assessment, and a discharge plume model, end quote. And the IUB, bowing to their pressure, upheld these claims, ruling on February 10th, 2023, that the pipeline companies did not need to file a discharge plume model and risk assessment, nor emergency response plan. Consequently, none of the Iowans who live, work, or go to school within the hazard levels identified by dispersion analysis have been allowed to see the report. They have not even been notified about the threat to their safety and lives nor have our emergency responders who are tasked with rescuing them had a chance to evaluate the information. In fact, the IUB itself has refused to allow Iowans in these hazard zones to participate in the hearing as interveners or witnesses, including myself. Only those who actually have the pipe going through their property have been accorded that right, although even they haven't been permitted access to the dispersion modeling. This means that there are people who live within a few hundred feet of the proposed route, that is to say, within hazard level four, which means likely unconsciousness within one minute and death within 10 minutes, who have not been given access to the information necessary to defend their lives, nor the means to testify before the IUB, participate in discovery, or cross-examine those who have so callously marked them out to carry this burden of risk. On the summit docket, one Iowan wrote recently, and I will read her letter because it is so uh, well expressed. She wrote, my neighbors were not consulted, considered, or compensated when the landowner across the road signed an easement with Summit Carbon Solutions for a 12-inch CO2 pipeline. My neighbors live 473 feet from that proposed pipeline, well within the kill zone. These neighbors filed to intervene in the summit proceedings, but the IUB denied their petition. Another neighbor lives 699 feet from the proposed CO2 pipeline path. They too petitioned to intervene and were denied. Other neighbors live 485 feet, 637 feet, and 846 feet from the pipeline. When the inevitable breach on this forever pipeline happens, some of these neighbors will have a few more seconds than others to figure out why they are suffocating to death. None of these neighbors deserve to be placed in that position. None deserve to surrender their safety, health, lives, and financial security to a CO2 pipeline company. None had a voice in choosing, approving, or being paid for the inconvenience and danger. It appears these neighbors are considered sacrificial 
Collateral damage forced to pay an unjustifiable personal price to satisfy the governor's wealthy donors and for-profit private businesses, end quote. All of the neighbors she mentions live within the hazard zone described by research on CO2 plume dispersion modeling, and all of them were denied the chance to intervene. And what she describes is not an exception, but the rule in Summit's routing. This map posted to the summit docket on September 11th, 2023 by Timothy Johnson, a witness for the Iowa Farm Bureau Federation, shows the areas in blue where the proposed summit pipeline and other populated areas are within 1,000 feet. A distance of 1,000 feet, according to the plume dispersion model, places everyone, no matter the pipeline diameter, within hazard level two, the level that, quote, poses an immediate threat to life, could cause irreversible or delayed adverse health effects, or could interfere with an individual's ability to escape, end quote. And for the portion of the pipeline route that has a 20 inch diameter or higher, 1000 feet corresponds to hazard level four or significant likelihood of death. This table lists the distance from other populated areas to Summit's proposed pipeline. A distance of zero indicates that the populated area and the pipeline route intersect. That includes towns like Mason City, New Hampton, Charles City, Shenandoah, Irvington, Nevada, and Goldfield. Over a dozen cities are within less than a thousand feet. It also must be mentioned that Sioux City, a high population area with a density of over a thousand people per square mile, and so within a different category altogether in terms of the risk of a major accident hazard, is also within a thousand feet of Summit's proposed route. Tens of thousands of people will be living within the hazard zones. This final map drills down even further to the house-by-house -house details and shows the 495 structures that are located within 400 feet of Summit's proposed pipeline. According to the plume dispersion model re research, for areas where the pipe diameter is to be 8 inches or larger, these structures are within hazard level 4. For all pipe diameters, they are within hazard level 3. We must conclude that according to the plume dispersion research, these people do not stand a chance of surviving a pipeline accident. But unless the actual pipe went through their property, they were each denied the chance to bear witness to the IUB about their plight. In fact, all of these maps taken together demonstrate that tens of thousands of Iowans whose lives hang in the balance were not allowed to intervene before the IUB. And this was a denial of our rights on a fundamental human level. As it turns out, Summit and Wolf were incorrect when they claimed that parties at the state and local levels could not request access to information about plume dispersion modeling and risk assessment or emergency response plans. Last September, Alan Mayberry, Associate Administrator for Pipeline Safety under the auspices of FEMSA, wrote letters to Summit, Navigator, and Wolf detailing the distinct roles played by federal, state, and local governments in evaluating and regulating the risks posed by CO2 pipelines. The end of each letter summarizes, each community affected by an existing or proposed pipeline faces unique risks. The effective control and mitigation of such risks involves a combination of measures employed by facility operators, regulatory bodies, community groups, and individual members of the community. It is clear from FEMSA's letter that the issue of CO2 pipeline risks is a matter of importance for multiple stakeholders, including members of state and local governing bodies. The letter continues. It is important that all stakeholders carefully consider land use and development plans to make risk-informed choices that protect the best interests of the public and the individual parties involved. Land use is a technical term in this context. We've seen it before in the UK's Health and Safety Executive Report on CO2 in reference to using the thresholds of SLOT and SLOD for land use planning. The dispersion models and emergency response plans are meant to guide land use and thus the routing of the pipeline. FEMSA understands what the Health and Safety Executive has written. Indeed, contrary to Summit and Wolf's claims in the docket from November 10th, 2022, FEMSA clarifies that sharing appropriate information with state or local governments and emergency planners, which may include dispersion models or emergency response plans, may help stakeholders make risk-informed decisions. 
Information and participation then are the keys to developing responsible ethical governance. And this is precisely what the IUB has denied to Iowans. Council for the Iowa Farm Bureau Federation requested that the IUB take official notice of this letter from FEMSA. But as of the writing of this video, the IUB has not filed a written order regarding this issue. Clearly, the IUB has violated FEMSA's call for community-wide information sharing and participation. But we're Iowans, so we're doing it ourselves. Nevertheless, the IUB's refusal to come to terms with their responsibility is concerning. If the IUB is not capable of acting responsibly and fulfilling the requirements of their position of power, then they should be removed from their position of authority. Because with power comes responsibility. But more than their duty to adhere to federal guidelines is their duty to an even greater law. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We neighbors all across Iowa are standing together and we will not be silent. Though these carbon pipeline proposals have already forced upon us significant harm. Summit and Wolf's applications must be denied. The burden of securing profits for private industry should not fall on the shoulders of the public. Summit and Wolf want to take our land, our water, even barter our lives for the billions that they stand to make. But there is no amount of money capable of purchasing moral character. Thank you.